Right, so hi um, everybody, I'm Julia and I'm part of the Internal Pouch Subcommittee for IA and um, I've just been asked just to kind of give my, um, my history really and my story and just to see whether I'd be able to, um, as a team, we can all support each other. So here I am with my family, I'm 50. One next week, I'm hanging on by my fingertips, um, and this is going to be this is my journey. So, um, this is a positive story, and um, I count myself as one of the uh, the lucky ones. Um, right, so my story began um, when I was 25, and I had lots of um, I had ulcerative colitis. Um, which was diagnosed over many months, maybe a year of lots of diarrhea and blood. Um, so I just really struggled with the disease and was on various amount of medication, as you can see. And um, towards the time, towards the end of this period of my life, I was getting a lot weaker and I was going to the toilet about 30 times a day. I just wasn't having quality of life and also messing myself on the doorstep which I'm sure many of you have kind of um, been through in, in the times of when we've had our bowel disease um, so I knew that things had to change now that was me um, obviously you can see that I was full of steroids um, and but still put a smile on it um, I had to do that um, so anyway, uh, at the end of the four years, I was had really deteriorated in hospital yet again and had a TPN line fitted and told that my colon had to be removed. Um, and obviously, like most of you, those who have had to face this surgery, I was devastated. I was in my late 20s and I had all these questions of what would I look like? Would people be able to smell me? I told my husband, who I was due to marry nine months later, to walk, but um, he responded really well. Um, my family, well, that was a little bit head in the sand um, situation, but um, I knew that they loved me, but they couldn't cope with the situation. So it was down to Darren and I just to um, get on with it. So the decision was made to prepare me for surgery with blood um, transfusions and... Um, that was it really, I mean, I didn't really have much of a choice. And so then I had surgery. So this is me five months after surgery um, on a cruise ship. <laughs> I went with my mum, it was just before, um, or four months before my wedding day. So um, as you can see, my hair was falling out, but I wasn't in a hospital. And there I was on our wedding day. Um, my hair had started to grow back. Obviously, I had to have it all cut short. Um, so there was Darren and I and Ruby, my stoma, who had saved me. And um, on a honeymoon, as you see on this slide, I was parasending with a swim skirt to hide my bag. And I was parasending off the back of the speedboat, screaming my head off and loving life because I had control again and I was alive. But, um, and life with Ruby was fine. Um, I had a normal diet, was able to make sure that I chewed everything. Marshmallows was my friend, just picking everything up. Um, and I, I was constantly emptying the bag, but that was down to me to um, get my head around that any little bulge I could see that I might have to my bag. But then I had troublesome with my rectum where the disease was still at. Um, so the discussion about the J pouch um, was brought up and um, they just said, you know, we've got to give this a try. We've got to remove the rectum anyway. What have you got to lose? And I did have all these questions, as you can see on the screen, you know, like my family were like, of course, you must do it. But I was quite happy with my stoma because it had given me my life back and my husband at the time, obviously, he, you know, was then had been, oh, get your words right, Julia. He had become my husband and he was fully supportive. And he said, whatever you want, as long as you're happy and you're well, I'm happy. But 
but then I thought, well, I've got to give it a try and let's go for it. So I went for the surgery and I had a loop stoma, which was not fun. As those of you who may have had a loop stoma, it's different to an end stoma and um, had lots of burnt skin. Uh, but once my stoma nurse had adjusted the stoma bag, um, that was okay. Um, and I wasn't, as I put there, I wasn't sorry to say goodbye to that stoma because that was a nightmare. So this photograph here is a photograph uh, two weeks after surgery. So you can see there that um, when I had my stoma removed, um, they had just gone in, removed this, uh, sewed up the stoma, pushed it back in. And you can still see the ring where my bag had been. And obviously all the other scarring are my, where they removed my colon and my rectum and you know various other operations I had. Um, yeah, I was worried about going back to the life with ulcerative colitis. And I was running back to the toilet again and again, thinking I'm going to have an accident like the days of having ulcerative colitis. But I decided that I was going to take control. This was not going to control me like the disease had. So I jigged around for a little bit and um, held on as long as I possibly could before I would go to the toilet. And I had good control. I had a sore bottom. So for me personally, Sudocrine was my best friend and helped me a lot. And also being in the shower, constantly putting warm water on myself uh, down below. That was really nice as well. Oh, sorry. And um, then, see you laughing, Maggie. <laughs> um, and then I was, Hard, not having any leakage at all at night and uh, life, life was good life was okay and I was settling into um, my life with a J pouch and then I decided well I've always as a little girl I've always wanted to be a mum and they did say to me about having all this surgery it may affect my fertility and I just spoke to my surgeon and said we really want to try for a baby and he said, go for it. So we went for it and there I am with my big bump. And um, I fell pregnant after trying for uh, three months. And I was so healthy, had a bit of pulling on my scar tissue when the baby was growing. But um, I was told that I, to protect my sphincter muscles, I would be having a C-section for the birth of my baby. And so I had a little bit of trouble emptying the pouch at, towards the end of pregnancy as I got really big. So at 38 weeks, I had my Isabella and my pouch surgeon was there with me and with everybody else. So, um, and then two and a half years later, we had Harry. And it was after that that they said, oh, Julie, you're going to come back for a third. And I said, no, I think I've, I've pushed my luck far enough. And that was when I was still pregnant with Harry. So I didn't know he was a boy, actually, when we had that conversation or whether he's healthy. But it, there was a, a certain amount of risk. And I just said, no, that's that would be my lot. So when I had Harry, um, I was sterilised at the same time because it was cesarean and the... Um, <coughs> surgeon just um, told me that he would sterilise me there and then, which my husband was very pleased about. Um, so over, overall, my pouch has been terrific. I've been one of the lucky ones and I've never looked back. Um, wind can be very uncomfortable with my pouch and embarrassing too. Um, some pouches are able to pass wind without being on the toilet. I cannot. So um, I go to the bathroom. I'm a lady after all. <laughs> so I go to the toilet and I know that I won't have an accident if I'm going to be passing wind. So I just sit on the toilet. Uh, peppermint tea always helps me with my wind and I try not to have too much garlic because that um, encourages wind with me. Uh, because I've had a lot of surgery and obviously two cesareans on top, and um, I've had a lot of problems with adhesions 
um, internal scar tissue. So I am limited with my diet. Um, and so I am on a low fiber and low residue diet, which generally you'd be put on after surgery. But um, I've remained on that. Um, I do have like in, um, what was her name? Uh, Sophie's talk. I do have smoothies. Um, and so I do get my vitamins that way. And I do have smooth peanut butter. So I'm pleased that um, that is all okay. Um, so I have had some blockages because of adhesion. So I make sure I don't sit down on the floor when I eat. I sit up nice and straight and I chew my food really well. And I haven't had any major blockages for about eight years now. Um, I have had um, a procedure to stretch my towel end where it become uh, dilated. I had become narrow, so it had to be dilated. Um, that was done, and now I've been given a rectal dilator uh, myself. So I was advised just to kind of use that. Initially, it was every week. I'm a bit naughty, I don't do it as much, but I, I do try and do it as much as I can. Lots of lubricant, put the dilator up my back passage, give it a turn 10 times, pull it away, wash it, and that's it. It just keeps it open because it was always narrowing. Um, so I'm living life to the full, um, exercising and I'm sector of North London, IA, and obviously as I say, I'm on this committee. So um, in this presentation, I normally in the past have given to nurses and um, other doctors to kind of give a patient's perspective. So I'm sure a lot of you that I'm speaking to today totally understand. Um, and some of the, you that are about to join your, uh, you know, and have your journey, it is a bit of a tricky time. But in conclusion with it all, yes, I wish it hadn't happened to me, but it did. And I, I think once you get your head around it, everything's fine be positive, live life to the full, and it is okay, it's all right. Some people do have a lot of problems with their pouches, I understand, and this is my personal experience, um, which has been a good one. I've been lucky enough to have my two children as well. Um, Isabella's now 18 and Harry's come up to 16, and um, life's been, life has been really good. So I do hope that this has um, helped with giving my story. And yes, it has been a bit of a bumpy road and um, there's been a few blips along the way, but that's life. And just pick yourself up and dust yourself back down again. So that is me really. Um, I do hope that's been helpful. Um, would there be any questions? And the, the questions have to come through chat. Yes. Um, so if there's any questions on there. Um, yeah, the, and, 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 Julie, Julie, I was interested in that you were talking about wind because that's sort of a, a big deal for me. Has, has anybody got any? Oh, they can't, can't contribute, can they? Um, one of the things that I've found helps with wind is, is peppermint capsules. Mm. I don't know if, if anybody else has got any suggestions, if you'd like to put them in. Or, so we, we have got a question here from somebody saying, what are normal meals during the day? And we're lucky, really, because we've got uh, the pouch nurses from St Mark's with us who might be able to help with that. For me, I'm able to just eat. I do eat pretty normally, actually. I don't, you know, I don't have to be particularly careful, but I definitely don't eat as much as I used to eat. You know, I think I some mean, smaller for, portions. For me, with normal meals, it would be um, because I am on such a low residue and low fiber diet. Um, for breakfast, I would have yogurt uh, with some honey. Um, also, I would. Um, have herbal life um, that is just like a shake that I would have I work in a special needs um, school so I just have that while I'm on the run for my lunch and then for evening I would have um, any lean meat uh, but generally I would have chicken or fish and 
also um, I have rice or pasta or potato. So yes, it's um, that that is what my normal meal would be. And I just see on there it's how do the rectal dil dilator help you? Well, with myself it helped me because I had such a narrowing in my back passage that um, I had to have a procedure um, to have it um, stretched because I was having trouble emptying my pouch. But um, I put up the dilator and it just keeps it open and it just it it helps a lot with me personally. Um, I don't know if the pouch nurses can add anything else to that. Sorry. Hello. Hello. It's nice to see you again. Thank you. <laughs> Every time I hear your story, I'm still amazed and you look fabulous as per usual. As per is that an exercise bike behind you? That's not <laughs> mine, it's my husband's. <laughs> you should have let that one go because that's one of the things. Um, I think you've explained the rectal dilator um, excellently. They're just to keep any potential stenosis at the bottom where the pouch joins the anal canal open. It is a join. So most likely it will scar over time. There's not a specific time. As you said, you didn't really listen to the pouch nurses and didn't use it as often, but you are <laughs> fun. So sometimes we tell people to use them a little bit more knowing that they probably wouldn't. But the idea is that you work out just before it starts to narrow and you have problems so that you don't end up having to have an operation because that's the last thing that people really want to have reoccurring. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and I did have to have one of those um, operations to have that done. So I did try to do it with me whilst I was awake. And yeah, it, it was a painful, <laughs> painful process. No, not at all. So, um, yeah, so uh, yes, so I'm very naughty. So as I've spoken about it, I'm bound to be doing that. Really <laughs> That'll be your job tonight. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, definitely. Um, Oh, I've just looked on there. Was there anything else on there, Maggie, that you can see? Um, no, there's a question about the rectal dilator and somebody else asking if the pouch notes were from St. Michael's were on that. I, th I think they perhaps heard me say the pouch nurses from St. Mark's were here and, you know, we're really pleased to have Raleigh and Petya and, and Zara with us. Thanks for having um, So, um... I wonder if, if the, while we've got the experts here, if you could tell us something about pouchitis and how you know if you've got it. I've been lucky, I've always escaped it, but what would the symptoms of it be? And what would you, what would you recommend to, you know, what is the treatment for it? Well, shall I start? Yes, I'm going to try to give us all a little bit of time to talk. So for a lot of patients, pouchitis is inflammation of the pouch usually um, mimics what people have experienced with ulcerative colitis. So frequency, higher volumes of going to the toilet may present with urgency, the need to, to you know, not be able to hold when they feel the urge to go to the toilet. Some people present with blood or bleeding. Um, and um, for some people, a temperature or feeling generally unwell. The problem with pouchitis is it's very hard for some people to tell if they've got pouchitis or they have something, um, an infection or C. diff or other things. So to really be clear that you have pouchitis, uh, you should have an endoscopy and you should have biopsies of the pouch, which say that you have got a, a level of inflammation that is in line with having pouchitis and also um, have clinical symptoms because sometimes people have a pouchoscopy and it may look that they have pouchitis, but if they're generally well and they don't have symptoms, then we don't treat them. It is more common in people who have had ulcerative colitis than FAP or other illnesses which have um, led to pouch formation. And I think that you're very lucky to have not had it, um, and that's quite mm -hmm. good because. Um, in the literature, up to 50% of people get pouchitis um, at least once with a pouch. Thanks, Sarah. 
Um, we've, we've had a question. Does pouchitis present with mucus? It can, um, but again, it's, it's quite individual. Some people may not even know they've got pouchitis. Some people just feel really unwell. And the one thing that I do say, it's usually documented, it's an increase in frequency, but you've got to remember that some people have a, 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 a frequency of about five times, six times a day. So it's whatever is not right for you. I think that's more important. Some people might pass mucus as, you know, a usual um, function of their pouch. I would say, look for things that are just not your usual. And if you're worried, contact somebody. Oh, thanks for that. Because okay. we really like to hear from people a little bit earlier than Friday afternoon to be told that <laughs> you've been suffering for weeks and weeks, because we do want to make sure we have time to sort of investigate this and get a proper history. Yeah, thanks. So, so would, would you suggest then that people need to go to their stoma nurses rather than through their GPs? Um, well, I would suggest you go to somebody who's got good knowledge of you and your pouch. Um, Rally, do you want to just explain our little patient passport and the importance of people being able to know their own medical history? Because um, I think that might be something worth sharing and to stop me talking. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about the passport as well a bit later on. It's something we've introduced uh, recently for our pouch patients. Uh, what it is, it is a booklet that it helps us get your up-to-date medical and surgical history, any medications you might be on, any other conditions that might put you at risk. So we might need surveillance. It asks about your pouch function. So we ask people, especially new pouch patients that refer to us so we have a better idea and we can offer you the help you need. For example, sometimes we would think that um, there is nothing wrong, but then we, when we can see what other um, medical conditions you have or what medications you are on, that usually helps us. Hmm. Thanks. That, yeah, Thank that, you, Riley. Sounds interesting. Okay, we, we've had... So that we can help you remember some of the things that you might forget mm. or not think that important mm. before we can make a diagnosis or, or a treatment. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's really interesting. Thanks, really useful. We've had a message saying that um, the participants can unmute themselves and have video during the workshops and you know there aren't lots of us so if you'd like to just open up if you want open your, your microphones up and pose questions that would be okay there aren't lots of us here we've we've had some other questions put to us in advance of of today somebody asked um about cream and sore skin and what would be rec what would be recommended there and personally, I've I think I must have tried every cream there is on the market um, until I found a couple that I settled on. Have you, uh, have you got any suggestions about skincare for butt bone? Any, anybody? What, what would the experts suggest? When, when I left, I was told yeah. to left hospital. I was told to use Sudocrem. That actually didn't work for me, but I found something since that did. What honest, I think, oh, go on, Petia, please. What we've noticed with our pouches is that uh, just like everybody has their pouch dif working different for everyone, it is mm. the same thing with the creams. What works for one person doesn't necessarily work for everyone. For some people, pseudo cream works just fine. Other people might struggle for a few weeks or months to find the best thing for them. But we usually have a quite uh, wide range of products that we've already tried out with our patients and know what works in general. So we would suggest different kinds of creams. And if that works, then we'll, they'll go with this. But we always suggest if something works for you, don't try to change it, just stick with this. 
because it is sometimes very difficult to find the one that works for you yeah. and your pouch. And that's brilliant, Petty. And just to add on that, I think what we try to do as clinicians is prevention is better than cure. So you shouldn't just have to have a sore bottom. It's sort of knowing what triggers your pouch, you know, the what comes out of the pouch, what, how, you know, what your diet and lifestyle is. Because sometimes if you know what's irritant in your output, that can sort of preempt what's happening. We also advise um, Clinelle barrier wipes. I don't know if anybody here has tried them. Unfortunately, again, they're not on prescription. Um, you do have to buy them at a cost, but we do use them in intensive care and on wards where people are sometimes immobile, the elderly care wards. And if you read the sides, they sound fantastic. I mean, you can clean an area, moisturize, protect all in one wipe. So it does leave a bit of a layer and a protection. So what I usually say to patients are, if you're going out and you know you may not be able to, you know, wash properly or clean properly, again, try and prevent. So sometimes we've had lots of feedbacks about handheld B-days, that sort of, you know, people can wash if they're out or not, or at work, so that they're really preventing getting a, a, a sore bottom because it's, a, it's an area that's nice and warm, you can't really take your underwear off and walk around to air that area all the time. So we really try as clinicians to probably do prevention. And then, yeah. as, as Petty said, really, most barrier creams would work depending on who it is. And I've just seen, yes, Petty and Rally are sisters, but um, <laughs> like me, for those of you who know me, I have a twin and funny enough, they are twins as well. So oh. <laughs> um, the pouch team has an affinity with twins, bar one pouch nurse at St. Mark's, everybody else has had a twin sibling. So this is just keeping in the theme. Yeah, that's amazing. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, you mentioned your passport that you've created. Is that just particularly for St. Mark's patients or is it something that has been shared with other hospitals? Uh, this is our uh, pouch chair sort of passport. It's just our pouch team. It is not okay. shared. The, the other question I have, it's a more general one. Um, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm one of the people that goes visiting with, with IA and I occasionally get people ring me up and invariably if they have problems their local hospital will or their GP will refer them to St Mark's as a centre of excellence to try and investigate the problems that they're having. Um, it's very difficult if uh, to get advice from stoma care nurses about pouches. Um, they're not experts in the field and quite often the hospitals will only you know create one or two or three at most pouches in a year. So where you know can we contact St Mark's nurses if we have a concern? Do we need to go through our GP to be referred? How, how, how does it work if you just want to talk to someone that is a clinician in that area without you know, um, being absolutely referred to St. Mark's. Should we just pick? <laughs> so I'll start then. So we would love to just see everybody who has a pouch because um, I've been very pri privileged at St. Mark's to have funding and investment for a team of, you know, three nurses. We are all qualified stoma nurses. We've all been qualified stoma nurses. So we know how difficult it is as a stoma nurse to invest enough time with pouch patients to understand. And I think that's the problem that stoma nurses have is that we spend all day with pouch patients. I've spent the best part of 17, 18 years managing pouch patients. Working in a specialist center is the only way that the clinicians are going to have the expertise to help people. The problem that we have as clinicians is, number one, as you say, the GP referral is what brings the funding in. So if we need to see patients, we need to have the correct funding. 
and that gets very complicated. Secondly, we need to have the workforce. So as well as seeing patients on the wards, new pouch patients of St. Mark's, to support people who we don't know, which is why um, Rally and Petia designed this passport, because we were trying to help people without a lot of information. But it also takes a lot of manpower for us to, and administration to physically um, find this information, correspond with GPs. And it's also very difficult to tell other areas what treatments we advise or things that we would prescribe if that's not on their formulary or that's not what they usually do. So these are, these are things that we would love to do. And this is something that we are working on. It's just, it's slow. So yes, you can by all means get a referral to St. Mark's, but we have been quite delayed with COVID in the patients that we have on the lists. The consultants waiting lists are huge. So it's, it's an ongoing battle, but it's a point well noted and we are trying to work on it. Mm -hmm. Is the, is the passport, the, you know, the information that you recommend, is that available on the St. Mark's website? No, but you will see it in Raleigh's presentation later. Oh, that's fabulous, thanks. Yeah. yeah. And just to add to what Zara said, yes, we need you to be referred as well, so we know more about you and as well for funding, but we have our advice line and we we'll always provide some initial advice for you. But in order to be able to treat any problems, we need you to be referred. Mm. But, but is the advice line open to non-St. Mark's patients? Yes. Oh, that's great. Thank you. That's really helpful. But we are just a little bit limited, as Patty yeah. says. So we yeah. can listen and we can, but we can't really do too much suggestive. Yeah. And we've also got our email. So we now have a generic email, which is on all of our presentations, I think. Right. So, or we can make sure that we can share that because sometimes we, we're not available to answer the phones. So if, mm -hmm. if it's not an urgent thing that you need us for, maybe an email would suffice as well. Can, can I ask a question? Because you, you, sorry, again, um, you moved from St. Mark's to Central Middlesex and, and, and I need to contact you at some point. And I struggled to find the right phone number and email address on your website. Is it, is it now um, correct on the website? Yeah, it is, yeah. Yes. And where um, are you at the moment? Are you in Northwick Park or Central Middlesex? So I think this is what the, the problem is. St Mark's is still St Mark's. We're just at different sites. So we have St Mark's at Northwick Park and we have St Mark's at Central Middlesex. So it's the same team. So for example, one day I might be in Northwick Park, Petia might be in Central Middlesex. We're still St Mark's. And I think with COVID, we haven't had the, the means of communicating clearly. In fact, the staff didn't quite know what was happening. So, I mean, it's, it's not very clear, but I think the way that we're selling it now, we understand it, is that we are still St Mark's we are at Northwick Park, but we're mainly at Central Middlesex. And I think the plan for the consultation in the future will be that we will be at Central Middlesex Hospital site. That will be the main place where we have our consultant outpatients, the pouch nurses, the services reside. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's really helpful. Um, I know that Mich I know that Michelle's got a question, but I know there's a question on the way from Michelle. Um, some somebody has asked us how likely they are to get a hernia behind the old stoma site once they've got a pouch. Is that is that very common? Would you say? Any, anybody? We, we were thinking about this, funny enough, when we were listening to the hernia presentation earlier today, because it is quite confusing. And I think even for clinicians, we're always learning. So it's, there's, there's, there wasn't anything that I could actually see that was sort of high quality research done. So this might be a bit of a job for us. But I think it was quite interesting on the mindset of how we treat people with possible hernias and, and that sort of 
spectrum of do nothing to go and do everything. So I think it's very interesting from this morning that we're going to probably have a chat. So the answer to that question is, sorry, I don't have a statistic unless Petia and Rao do. Mm. Yeah. But, do, but do, you, do you see many? Is it, is... So uh, I would say no. Mm -hmm. But again, it's people complain of, pro and, and being a tertiary referral centre, a lot of the times we manage, you know, obstructive symptoms around the closure site, people who can't evacuate properly, um, more than dealing with a surgical, somebody needing a surgical operation for a hernia. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm not sure if my pronunciation is going to be correct on this, so sorry, Zara. Um, ankylosing spondylitis, AS, arthritis, is commonly associated with ulcerative colitis. Obviously, having your colon removed doesn't remove colitis. So, so what are the symptoms and how do we treat it? Because I get terrible problems with my knees and the, the doctors are doing x-rays and saying it's um, arthritis and this and that. And I, and I have tried to talk to them about this condition but they look at me like anything to do with j pouches with a vacant glaze over their face so um yes that's that's usually the case unfortunately with mm -hmm. the patients and i'm going to let petty and rally probably prepare an answer for this but i think what we've got to remember is the pouch is only one part of our wonderful makeup you know as any other sorts of you know comorbidities we can have is not always linked to the pouch. Yes, you still have, you know, colitis. Um, there's an underlying, you know, inflammation response. However, um, I think you need to, to, to speak to the specialist rheumatologists um, and, and people who, or even an endocrinologist um, who, who deals with different things. It may be hormonal, it may be inflammatory. Help me, girls, please. I've just dropped the yeah. pen. I just actually, last week we had one pouch patient that was saying that he was just diagnosed with it. So what he was saying is that he was having a lot of pain and stiffness in his lower back. But what would make it better for him? I don't know if that's the case usually for everyone. is actually exercise while when he's not moving his experience is much more simple. Um, so that's something usually what as well I've seen on the NHS website saying that exercise makes things better mm. and not exercising makes things worse and the pain more uh, severe. But you are gonna need to be seen by a rheumatologist and discuss different treatments because Unfortunately, we are not specialists in this and we won't be able to advise you what exactly to do. We can just give you some general advice from what we've heard from other patients and what we've researched, but that's it. Yeah, I've seen an MSK consultant and um, they've now gone the line, down the lines of patellofemoral pain, PFJ. Um, and again, as I said, they, they kind of dismissed the um, others, the others diagnosis, and they've given me exercises, as you've said. So, yeah, um, I'm really sorry, it's very difficult. I think someone's got their mic. I need one, it's only four together. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, sorry, okay. Ask everybody to, to mute, please, if uh, and just to raise your hand if you if you want to speak. That, that seems to have sorted. No, it's still, it's still there. It's background noise. I have messaged him, but he hasn't seen That's it. better. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. I'm getting older. <laughs> yeah, I just think the important thing, thanks Petty for that, is that just because you have a pouch, you, you can potentially have other things that need to be investigated. I think it's a little bit of a cop out for medical people just to say, well, you've got a pouch, that's the cause. Well, it's not. You can, you know, have things investigated fully. Yeah, thank you. And good well, luck. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>
On that note, um, Zara, can I just ask, would you recommend that we would um, have like kind of um, our internal pouches checked on once a year or if it's not broken, just don't touch it? So I know I sound like everything is down to cost and workforce, but unfortunately in the NHS it is. So in 2008, we stopped um, doing annual pouch reviews on people that were well. So yeah, Julia, I think if it's not broken, don't fix it. But that goes again, the importance of knowing what normal is, so that if you are concerned that you can, you know, investigate it and not wait. And I suppose this is the other thing that Petia Rally and myself have been looking at in our spare time is how surveillance is done. So in St. Mark's, we used to, um, or we still do, make sure that people who've had a, a rectal cancer history when they took their colon out, people with chronic pouchitis or um, people with PSC, um, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, which is a liver condition, we make sure these people have an endoscopy every year. The unfortunate thing is that with COVID, we, we've got a really huge backlog in the endoscopy department. So it's sort of us now trying to compile a list of the really high priority, high risk people. So even if there were people who just wanted to have a scope, we wouldn't be able to do that. But you could always speak to us if you're worried. And if we do think that you are warranting a scope, we will get it organized. Okay. All right, lovely, but, thank you. But, but is there a recognize, I mean, is, is there a sort of protocol for time? You know, should people be scoped every five years or? Um, that's where in the literature it varies. And we're having discussions even with St. Mark's and other hospitals as to broadening the scope. So for example, people with cophitis, other inflammatory conditions, whether these people should be added to a list because worldwide the, the literature really varies and, and the, the guidance. So the bottom line, as I always say, learn what your normal is, what's acceptable for you and what's normal and good for you. And then if anything changes and you're not happy, try and get some advice. Great, thank you. That's great, that's great. Well, I've just seen the time. I think it's lunchtime. I think it is. We can yeah. go out in that sunshine, hopefully. Yeah. Get I mean, a bit yeah. windy. And thanks for joining us for, you know, giving us your expert advice. That's fabulous, yes. that's really helpful. And thank you for giving us this opportunity because we learn a lot from our patients in days like this. Brilliant. Thank you Thanks. so much. Thank you. And um, well, we'll all be back for our one thirty-five with yourselves. Okay. That'd be great. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.
Hello, everyone. Welcome. We'll be able to answer some of your questions now because we didn't really have time after the presentation. So feel free to ask any questions and we'll be hopefully able to answer them. I have my colleagues, Petia and Zara here with me. I've got some questions. Um, if can you hear me? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if your pouch fails for any reason, um, would your pouch actually be removed, or would it be kept inside? It would really depend on everyone's circumstances, but at Sandmarks, we tend to, uh, what we would usually do is first uh, give a temporary soma and leave the pouch inside, um, just because the, the surgery of removing the pouch is quite complex, and unless there is indication to, to remove it, um, we will keep it unless it's giving us some problems or there is any underlying reason we wouldn't go immediately for removing the pouch. We just give you a stoma and go from there. And then in the future, if you think the pouch is, let's see, inside is uh, problematic, then the surgeon would discuss with you uh, the possibility of taking it out. Okay. And Can I ask this thing? Sorry, sorry, Andrew, go on. Uh, the question I was gonna ask is, is it a, um, terminal ileostomy that you create when you remove the sorry when you de de defunction the pouch or do you have a loop ileostomy um, at St Mark's we would give you an end ileostomy and, and not a loop ileostomy what do you do with the what do you do with the other end the bit that's at the top of the pouch where does that it would remain inside, but it would be closed, which are closed, so nothing's going down towards the pouch. Will it still create mucus that you have to get rid of? You mean the pouch? Yes. Yes, because of the pouch, just like your entire intestine, it's made from your small intestine, and um, the intestine has this natural function to produce mucus as a lubricant. We usually don't see it when it's mixed with feces, but um, most of the time when people have when people have the pouch and which is defunctioned, they may see some mucus. And that would really vary from person to person. There are people that have mucus um, more often. There are people that have it once in a while. It is really individual, it would depend on everyone's personal circumstances. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And so th that would be safe for it to be kept inside, though, if it was not causing any problems? Usually, yes, unless uh, there is any indication, for example, if there is um, cancer in the pouch, then that would be a different story. Okay, yeah, that's great. That's great. And so when um, you, we've had our colon removed, say for ulcerative colitis, would we... Would it be medically seen that we are cured from ulcerative colitis or would it be classified as not? Well, um, colitis is in the large intestine, the colon. So by removing the colon, um, you should be in theory cured from colitis. But then there is a thing if your surgery involves leaving in place your rectum, for example, when you have a stoma, you may have a flare up at that rectum because it still remains. And that is as well the case if when you have your pouch, we leave about just about that much of your rectal cuff. So we have something to join the pouch to. That little cuff might flare up sometimes, which is very rare. We usually see it in less than 1% of our patients. But it might happen, but it is not as bad as when people used to have their entire colon, because if you can imagine, it is just a small uh, area and it's not as large when you have the, the colon. So it is, but yes, it is treated after that big suppository. It's usually uh, like mesawazine or prednisolone. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Okay, that's great. Just, just to add to Petia, may I just say, I think that's an ongoing debate. And again, comes down to things like insurance companies, because some people have been told with insurance companies that they still have colitis, because colitis is a systemic illness. So um, as we heard before, you could still have other, you know, dermatology, other um, arthritic type rheumatology symptoms. So that's why sometimes you just have to read the small print of policies and things because some people may think with a pouch, you're still not cured of your colitis. It, which is crazy, isn't it? Because, you know, you have had the, everything removed for that disease to attack. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Because um, we just had a few questions that was like put to us. There was another one here about fertility. And in your experiences, like kind of with your patients, has there been a um, an option given to your patient about freezing eggs prior to pouch surgery? We wouldn't routinely advise people to freeze eggs. This is something that usually is advised for people undergoing treatments like chemotherapy, radiotherapy. Usually it is not something that's routinely otherwise advised for pouch surgery. Special. Okay, okay, because I just know that a lot of um, people have said about fertility, and obviously I know it was said to me personally as well about fertility. Um, luckily for me, it was okay, so that was one of the questions that they were worried about. I was going to say you should be the advocate for fertility <laughs> post pouch surgery, shouldn't you? You should be the banner girl. <laughs> yeah, but we're all unique, Zara. <laughs> we definitely are, and I think that's one of the questions we always get, and it's such a minefield because fertility is not just based on you having a pouch is it it's so many other factors mm -hmm. um and one thing we always say to our pouch patients especially the women is just be aware your partner has a role to play so it may not be anything <laughs> to do with you it yeah. might actually be your partner that needs to have a full check yeah 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 Okay, no, that's that's great. That's great. Um, and also, it's still recommended for women that are having uh, children to have C-section to protect their muscles. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think it's a very personal choice, but it's a risk that many people with a pouch wouldn't really take. Mm. Yeah. Okay, mm. that's great. That's great. Um, just having a look at some of these other questions. Um, one of the questions that came up was, are any pouch surgeries performed by keyhole surgery these days, where rather than the big open surgery that majority of us who've had our pouch for years have had, um, is it going more down the route of a keyhole surgery now? It would really depend on everyone and what is what past medical history you have or surgeries, but St. Mark's we have keyhole, we have open surgery, we have robotic surgery. Oh, wow. Okay. So I guess it depends whether it's an emergency and things like that, does it? Yes. Well, I think the pouch, do you mean, Julia, sorry, the pouch formation itself? Like yes. Yeah. Or, you know, and I mean, well, I, I guess also removal of the colon as well. Yeah. I mean, I guess it depends on how serious that is. But okay, so say if you had a, you'd had your colon removed, you've got um, an end ileostomy, and you're going to have a pouch formed. Could that be done by keyhole? So, as Petia said, definitely yes. However, if you look through the literature, the real pioneering surgeons of laparoscopic surgery sometimes argue that a pouch is never made fully laparoscopically because they do sometimes have to bring the small bowel out of the abdomen um, or into the into the cavity and there's disputes whether that is fully truly laparoscopic plus a lot of laparoscopic operations and again we're not surgeons but when we have seen a lot of the ports they're quite huge ports that they bring the bowel out of so even though when they pop the bowel back and the pouch and the, on the abdomen there's only a very tiny scar or port site. The theory is it wasn't done laparoscopically keyhole. But as nurses and as patients I think a lot of people are just happy that they haven't got that big huge incision. So I would say yes it's definitely laparoscopic. 
I mean, because I guess that's just a longer operation, but quicker to mm -hmm. heal and get back on your feet again. Mm -hmm. And preferably done by surgeons who are not only good at laparoscopic surgery, but colorectal surgery. I think that's very important to note. Yeah. Could I ask, please, is, is leakage always down to a weakness in sphincter muscles or could there be any other cause for it? Well, um, some people might have leakage, especially something that is new for them could be if they might have a stretcher narrowing um, of the joint. Um, again, there could be different reasons for this, and this is why it's always important to fully investigate all the reasons. Right. Yeah, but um, the other thing is as well, um, what we would usually go with first is get you into clinic, review, go through everything and see uh, what might be the reason and then try different things. And if that doesn't work, then we might need to refer you to uh, biofeedback for investigation to see if it is actually weak sphincter muscles. Right. Um, and just to add on to that, um, I think we sometimes as nurses, um, don't have time to invest in the psychology of patients because fear, um, not getting to the toilet, you know, the anxiety, um, sometimes some drugs or medication. Um, we know that loperamide has an action on sphincter muscles. So again, it's sort of a bigger picture instead of just a weak sphincter. Right, okay, thanks. I, I see we've got a question here from Lorraine uh, Murray. Um, hi, does your gallbladder removed affect your function of the pouch? It does, yes. Yes, it does. What we've seen with many people, it's removal of gallbladder. Um, it might make their function a bit worse than what it used to be, going more often to the toilet, um, having a bit more of a burning sensation as well. Okay, great, thank you. Because it's an irritant, the bile is an irritant. So that irritant in the bowel can make people more um, frequent or the output more irritant. But there are medications which can be used. Um, and um, colosiramine is one that we use with, with um, good effect in some people. And to be absolutely sure, uh, again, everything seems to be a bit debatable, but some surgeons argue just by not having a colon, you're going to get a level of bile salt malabsorption. Um, so everybody really has a level. And the, the, the best way to tell if it's actually bile salt malabsorption or something else when you've had a cholecystectomy is really to have a CCAT test where you can actually have a, a capsule swallowed and it, it follows the absorption of bile through the gut, and that's probably one of the better ways to decide what's happening, especially if you find a cholecystectomy. Okay, that's great. Um, we've got another one here about um, blockages, um, one that I'd be very interested in as well. What would you, um, so could you say like what the general symptoms would be if you think you have a blockage and is there anything you could do at home before going to hospital that could help um, move the blockage forward? You um, Well, first thing would be, um, the most often we have people with blockages around the old stoma site where the stoma used to be. So that happens often. Many people have blockages, so they might have pain in that area or, or general. Um, maybe you won't be going to the, to the toilet, might as well stop altogether. Your pouch might not be emptying. Uh, some people might start feeling uh, nauseous or vomiting. That would depend on the degree of blockage you have. And yes, we always advise on um, what to do at home so that you don't need to end up in hospital. Sometimes that doesn't work and you need to go to hospital, but uh, most of the time this could be managed at home as well. Uh, so things like um, 
Obviously, first we're gonna advise to stop eating because that would contribute to the blockage more. So the other thing is if you can drink uh, fluids only if you're not feeling like vomiting or nauseated, as that sometimes helps flush things down, uh, especially if you could tolerate maybe a full glass of warm drink, and that would help as well. Massaging the area where you feel like the block is where it's most painful, uh, using a warm bath, warm hot bottle, um, hot water bottle, because that helps the muscles relax and things move down. Um, as well, going for a walk, that helps also. And that's it pretty much. And usually um, we would advise to try all this. And if that doesn't work, you may need to go to a &E. If you have Zara's book, the every, we have a step-by-step -step as well. They are written what to be done in, in these cases, which is very helpful, very, very helpful for a few patients actually we have we had in the past few months that actually by going through the pages in the book that helped them actually move the blockage down and they didn't have to go to any. So that was quite helpful. Um, just thanks, Petia. Just to add, um, just that was excellent. Couldn't have said that better. Um, just to make sure that when people do have a slight blockage that they take note and I think a lot of blockages are reoccurring themes in people's lives so if they know that going down to the Chinese and choosing different things number 22 and 24 mm -hmm. doesn't really work well try and either avoid it or just be aware um, and once people do get a blockage if they they know sometimes like they'll call it going I did something really silly I went to this barbecue had too much to eat drank and ate at the same time there were big boluses of food then they get quite anxious and I think by being anxious that can even you know that can speed the gut up but it can also slow things down and make you know other problems so it's sort of being calm and focused if you do have a blockage and and I think the final thing I always like to say is if you do go to your local hospital, do not let anybody try to operate on you. Most blockages do get resolved. If, they, if they're if they not going to be resolved, you're in the best place for intravenous fluids so you don't get dehydrated, pain relief, and then usually time. And if the surgeons or, or whoever's looking at you in a &E, do come across any problems just make sure they do a scan because again my favorite line is it doesn't always have to be your pouch it could be the small bowel above your pouch um it can be quite a lot of you know other things it's, it's most likely causing you not to empty your pouch but the problem may not be your pouch and the last thing you want is another operation that may give you more mm. adhesions because adhesions on themselves can cause problems Okay, that's great. Yeah, I mean, because like with me personally, I know that it's my adhesions that always cause yeah. a blockage because I'm so careful with my diet. So, I mean, I guess in that if by the time that you're, um, you're vomiting, that is the time then really you need to go to the hospital. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say even if you even if you aren't vomiting, because some people don't vomit. Some people just feel really nauseated or they've stopped eating for too long. So they may not have eaten for a day or two. Then they're going to get other signs of dehydration. You know, in, in older people, it, it, it can be quite serious. And, and you don't want to give yourself sort of a kidney problem by becoming dehydrated or confused or anything like that. OK, okay that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, actually, going on to dehydration. Um, Obviously, I, I know it was covered um, a bit this morning uh, with the dietitian, but obviously drinking too much fluid for us people without a colon is can be a bit dangerous as well as not drinking enough. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Also drinking the right fluid. Okay. Uh, because as you said, you don't have the colon and your small intestine needs sometimes a bit more salt. 
just because what salt does, it helps your body keep the water in so your body can absorb it and, and keep you hydrated. So sometimes, especially when people are dehydrated, when you are working out a lot, you or it's hot and you're sweating, you might lose a bit more fluids. And what everybody would usually think of doing is drink more and more water. But when you don't have the colon and you do that, you actually might do the opposite because by not having salt in these drinks, you're actually flushing more uh, things out and becoming more and more dehydrated. So in these cases, what I mean with drinking the right fluids would be things that re help rehydrate you, things like um, uh, emix and max electrolyte solution or dialyte or glucosate support, things like this would help you replenish these losses and keep you hydrated. Okay, that's brilliant. Brilliant. That's thank Anyone else from the uh, pouch team that wants to ask a question? So that our ladies on behalf of our members. No? I don't um, want to hog it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was I was interested in whether or not we should be taking vitamin supplements with the pouch. Do if anybody has got any suggestions about that? I, I don't know about the nurses, but I I certainly do take B twelve and vitamin D, mm. um, only because I discovered, particularly with B twelve, that my level was going down. And rather than have injections, I just tried taking supplements uh, on the instruction of my uh, my doctor and they appear to have boosted my level. So although I'm not absorbing it as well as I could, by taking a larger dose of B12, it seems to have done the trick. So I do take it every day. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the nurse's view is on that. We Usually what we would advise to have uh, variety in your diet and we would recommend you check your GP checks all your bloods every year. And then if in your blood test, it shows any deficiencies, uh, then we'll go from there. Um, for example, as you are saying, if your blood test shows that you're low on vitamin D or vitamin B12, then uh, your GP is going to give you the right um, treatment for this. And then in a few months, repeat your bloods to make sure this has been corrected. Uh, apart from this, some people prefer to take multivitamins and what we would usually advise is that this is your choice, you could do this, but sometimes, especially with people with a pouch, you need to be careful when taking multivitamins not to have iron in them because iron may uh, irritate, uh, every, make your pouch more erratic and upset it. Thanks. Yeah, that's Thanks, Petia. Um, and just to kind of add to that, I think B12, um, because it's absorbed at the end of your small bowel, most pouch patients eventually may become deficient and need supplementation. And um, I think it was Andrew that said the best way to supplement, if that's the case, is through an injection, not really an oral tablet. Um, and again, I always say, if we know this is coming, prevention, I know I sound like a broken record, but again, um, GPs just sometimes wait till your vitamin B12 is technically low with a pouch. If we know this is going to happen <clears throat> and you're feeling lethargic or tired, any of the symptoms of a low vitamin B12, you should go to your GP and try and explain that your pouch where the vitamin B12, the area where it is absorbed normally, is now sitting in a pouch which is constantly um, in contact with stool. So like a sponge, it's soaked up with the, with the fecal content that sometimes the absorption of vitamin B12 is going to be low. So that's uh, something else to just be aware of. The other little thing which is interesting is that apparently we have stores of vitamin B12. So people with a brand new pouch may not find that they become deficient in vitamin B12 for many years. So they start off doing their bloods every year and then they kind of forget about it. And then probably about 10 years later, their vitamin B12s are really quite low and they've had a long period of struggling. So again, it's about making sure, regardless if you're feeling well or not, to try and get your blood done annually. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just jump Sorry, in there? 
come back to the question of iron. I know that I've long had a history of anemia, even pre-pouch, and it's gotten a lot worse since. Is there a version of iron that is easily absorbed, easy on the gut, easy on the pouch, that will prevent me going back, and others I know, going back in for yet another iron, iron infusion? Or will help slow the process of losing it down, if you see what I mean? Yes, there is. Um, what we've seen recently, there is Ferrocru. It's a, a new supplement. It's specifically created for IBD patients. It should be easier on the digestive system. So it is specifically made for patients with IBD. So it should, in theory, be better. The problem with it is it's much more expensive. So we sometimes struggle with GPs to get it prescribed. So they would try everything else before they put you <laughs> this, but sometimes it, they might just need advice because they might not know about it. Well, what's it called? For Ferra 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 Crew. Just we can type it into the Thank you. message. Mm. Is it a liquid or is it, does it come in tablet form? I believe it's in tablets. Mm, right. is there, is, is an infusion the best way to get iron? Because my doc, my GPs are always saying, oh, your iron's a bit low. Let me give you some ferrous fumarate. And then I say, oh, I've got an internal pouch and I'm not supposed to take it. And GPs don't seem to really understand how we're best to get iron. And one GP said to me, Oh, well, you're fine because iron is absorbed in your small intestine, so you shouldn't get um, low in iron because of having no colon. So again, with iron infusion, um, you need to, to keep in mind that we, in our hospital, we have a specific protocol and tells you when we would go for that. Because, yes, iron infusion is easy thing to do but there is a high risk of anaphylaxis with it. So we wouldn't really go for it unless it's indicated. So you always need to consider as well, there is also always that risk with iron infusion. So for example, if everything else doesn't suggest that you need that, you would go with tablets and oral therapy first. Again, we will try with the usual medications, then Ferrocru, at least at St. Mark's before we go to iron infusion, we would normally ask the GP to prescribe Ferrocru first, because again, iron infusion comes with risks. Can I ask whether my gastroenterologist was wrong, therefore, to prescribe me ferrous fumarate, which I just don't get on with? Um, the thing is with um, iron supplement is what they usually uh, is done is there is a recommendation to start with one certain medication and then just climb up with if that doesn't work you try the next the next choice and then the third one the fourth this is something as well that sometimes could be quite uh, frustrating for patients because it might take uh, months before you can actually get the right treatment but what we would usually ever advise GPs is that to be mindful that many people with a pouch do not uh, in general, most of them tolerate the oral uh, supplements and some of them tolerate better the liquid iron. And now, recently, we had this Ferrocru, which is for people with IBD, and it's supposed to be uh, easier on your intestine. But again, everybody is different. And, but this is uh, what we would try first. But there is, I wouldn't say there is wrong approach to it is just um, as well some GPs and might not be familiar, that familiar with pouches and they would just go to as well what um, the guidelines say and it would be start first with ferrous fumarate and things like this and just go from there if that doesn't work. That, that makes sense so you try it and if somebody doesn't deal with it then you go to the next item fair enough but at least I know there's something else I can try now. Because uh, I'm on ferrous fumarate, but I take it about once a month because it's horrible. Yeah. I also, um, I had a very long conversation with one of my patients recently about um, low iron levels. And it must be so frustrating because she was a young mum of two children. She was tired all the time. 
and her GP just kept prescribing, you know, tablets of different strengths and she was seeing the side effects. And I, as I said to her, there is that horrible cost hanging over every medication in the NHS. But if you put a logical case, a lot of GPs are quite helpful once they understand. And I think it's up to, um, we can have all the leaflets in the world, but a GP probably doesn't have the time to, to know everything about pouches. So what I said, you're the best advocate to go into your GP armed to kind of just succinctly tell them what the, the pouch does and the, the effects. Um, and um, Petty and Raleigh did an amazing bit on that iron infusion, but a lot of hospitals have an um, IBD nursing team. So a lot of our pouch patients are known to their IBD teams. So they're another link because they have specialist nurses there, which probably have better um, links to their GPs and, you know, the most up-to-date protocols, guidelines and some extra research. So though we're pretty good at doing pouch stuff, iron infusion falls into sort of a more gastroenterology medical IBD remit. So if you could get hold of your IBD nurses, they'll probably be quite useful to, you know, in your defence, to write letters to your GP or just mm -hmm. get the point across with some evidence. That's Thank great. you. That's uh, that's very sensible. Yeah. Good luck. Seems to be. <laughs> I <you>. need it. <laughs> Thank you. Have we got time I, to I one actually... quick question? Is that okay? That's just been put on the chat. Um, about um, is there any special advice for um, going through the menopause with a pouch, i.e., like HRT, whether you should have a coil fitted or not, whether you should have patches. Uh, what would be your advice, please, to this lady? Um, what we know about people with a pouch during the menopause is because of the hormonal changes, um, for some people, the pouches might be acting up a bit and um, be a bit more erratic and unpredictable for, for the time when you are going through the menopause. Um, we wouldn't really be able to advise you on the hormone replacement therapy. That's something to discuss maybe with either your GP or gynecologist. And because they'll be the best to advise you on this and the side effects, because you need to, again, as Zara was saying, consider your entire body, not just the pouch. Uh, and you need to look into the side effects for everything you're considering. And weighing the pros and cons for different things you would like to use and see what works best for you. That's an excellent answer, Petia. Again, um, menopause is difficult to treat with a colon and a healthy bowel. So I think it's quite a personal um, plan that you need to go through. But most treatments um, work well with, with a pouch. Okay, that's brilliant. That's great. Okay, let's look at the time. Okay, uh, what time do we have to finish? Oh, no. Deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then we'll be back for you at four o'clock, Zara. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you, everybody, and thank you, uh, ladies, for all your support. You've been absolutely fantastic. So, thank you so, so much for all your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.